Carbine Williams' place in history was assured when he perfected this little piece of metal, which is the operating heart of the famous M1 carbine. This remarkable man, confined and handicapped by the mistakes of his youth, overcame the personal tragedy of his stormy beginnings and went on to acquire fame, fortune, notoriety, and the respect of a nation grateful for his contribution to the war effort. I'm Harry Joyner, and at the editing table with me is lifelong friend Martin Hill. It was over 25 years ago that Harry and I had the unique opportunity to shoot some documentary footage of a very famous gun inventor. David Marshall Williams, Carbine Williams as he was known, lived in Godwin, North Carolina. And going over this footage, which has been stored for some 25 years, brought back a lot of memories. I remember when we started shooting uh, footage that first day with Williams, and we wanted to reconstruct a typical day in his life. And so we started out with this ambling walk from the house to the shop. He lived about, oh, maybe 150 yards from the shop, and he would go to work every morning before daylight. This was probably the most consistent thing about the man's life. This was predictable in every way. I remember filming the, this particular piece of business. While it has quite a natural look, which pleases me, uh, we had, I believe it was his brother, hiding over in one corner off camera, ready to throw the switch when he pulled the light chain in okay. order okay. to give us an appropriate picture. I recall you spent about an hour setting up that one silly little shot just so the light would look natural when he turned it on. Lighting the stove was a natural thing because uh, that was the only heat he had in that shot. And had it not been wintertime, uh, that uh, shop would have been a furnace. Those were some of his hand tools, beautifully built. Uh, the finest craftsmanship I've ever seen in regular common working tools. And he made them himself by hand. Absolutely, with the same attention to detail as he would a fine, complex mechanism. That was his lathe, which we were fortunate enough to get to shoot again in the museum where it's now uh, displayed. Which everyone will get to see in a few minutes. We caught him in a very good mood this day. He was, uh, he was uh, very cooperative, very happy to work with us. He seemed to be enjoying himself. Ordinarily, when we were around, he was in a good mood because this to him was a degree of publicity and a degree of attention, and he did enjoy attention. Yeah, he did. Stop. He was an unusual individual. He was, uh, he was a very quiet person. Yeah. But uh, when you shook hands with him, you'd want to be sure not to have a ring on your finger or he'd break your finger. It's a serious handshake, for sure. The first time I met him was at the Manor Theater in Charlotte, North Carolina. Me too. When, uh, <laughs> uh, he was uh, doing a little bit of a roadshow interview sort of thing when they were uh, uh, running the picture about his life. You can imagine uh, our surprise when we uh, walked into the Museum of History uh, and got access to the shop area, which had been closed up for many years, and saw our own picture hanging on the wall in the corner. I had forgotten about that, but that was a montage that I had made of him, well, of all of us, really, from our first day of shooting. I had shot a number of still pictures, and perhaps you had too. And we processed the film and made the montage and brought it back and gave it to Carbine on our next trip, and he was very much taken by it. I was uh, very touched to see that he thought enough of it to display it as part of his artifacts in the shop itself. And now it's as much a part of the exhibit as anything else. There. Indeed it is. It's nice to know your own picture hangs in a state museum. Uh, joining Harry and me today is Keith Strawn, who is the Curator of Technology at the North Carolina Museum of History, located here in Raleigh. Uh, Keith, thanks very much for letting us in. You're quite welcome. I'm glad to be of assistance. Uh, Carbine Williams is an important and interesting subject with us. He was a major gun inventor from North Carolina, and we thought we'd let you inside the shop so you could take some really neat footage, we hope, of these tools and items and in his inventions. Yeah, we really appreciate that because I know you don't let visitors inside the building itself. That's, that's true. The shop is all sealed up and people have to look in from the windows. You can't tell it from uh, where we're standing now, but the doorway behind us is usually fitted with a large glass or plastic Plex plexiglass, plexiglass cover yeah. to keep people out of this area. So we are, we are indeed privileged to uh, gain access to this room so that we can look at these exhibits. 
we are standing in front of one of the key machine tools in Carbine Williams shop. This is a brown and sharp milling machine uh, used to uh, machine uh, odd shapes and flat pieces of metal. I guess anything that's not turned on a lathe mm -hmm. worked on this machine. He spent a lot of time on this machine. Yeah, I remember in 66 we filmed him cutting metal on this machine when he was working on the prototype gun. And uh, it struck me at the time how meticulous he was, again, as we discussed on the lathe there. Uh, that he would clean and sweep and wipe it down and keep it in perfect condition after using it. We had a lot of fun moving this thing into the building from a crane. It was outside, you understand, you're on the second floor of the museum. And when after the building was moved into the museum, then these, these heavy machines were brought in using a, a I don't know, a derrick or a crane through one of the, the windows. We didn't, we didn't turn, turn it up the stairs, no. It, it's a little heavy, it's all cast iron. You know, this building is roughly, I would guess, 18 by 30, 25 or 30. Yeah. It's right. a good sized building to put inside another building which uh, doesn't have a ceiling any higher than this. What do you suppose is the largest and or the heaviest single component that you had to move to put this building together. I'm going to tell you the milling machine right here is going to be the one heaviest item. I don't know how much it probably has it on it somewhere, but it's uh, going to be a couple of tons anyway. As I said, the machine is a brown and sharp, which is uh, probably late 30s, maybe. That'd be my guess. Mm -hmm. uh, a very fine piece of equipment, and I'm sure Williams was very proud of it because, remember, so many of his famous designs were actually hand-worked with hand tools before he had access to relatively sophisticated equipment like this. And Carbine Williams, whenever he showed you the machine I was working around it, would take this mop on a stick and I wondered what that was. clean the oil off so it wouldn't get on his hat. That's what he always used that for. You know something I did spot a while ago when we were walking around is that there are still puddles of oil Come. Have you been using this thing? No, no, it's coming out of the machine. This has been in the museum now for 20 years. 20 years, yeah, 21 it's years. Still oil. Oil, it's like still dripping oil. It's still dripping oil. Department of Transportation was yeah. it, I believe, worked on this, cleaned it up a little bit when they brought it in here. We couldn't, we couldn't move it. We didn't have the, the facilities or the trucks or the know-how. Was it, was it real clean like this when it, you brought it? It was in? clean, and I think they oiled it. They um, probably wiped it off and, and set it in here, and, and they put it through the wall, the way they moved in the rest of the shop. So you really didn't have to refurbish it. You just no, uh -huh. brought it in and set it up and cleaned it off. Yeah. He kept everything clean. I would expect that to be the case. I, I never saw him abuse any tool or any of his, uh, his stuff. But no, all, all of his tools and all the stuff that we have him are really clean. He kept them up. Kept them up well. We noticed that. I have to say, whenever he would turn something or machine something, uh, he would take this brush that he kept on his workbench and he would spend forever wiping and cleaning, more, more so than you would expect would be necessary. But mm -hmm. I guess that was the nature of the man. I guess that's probably a tribute to uh, the precision that he worked with. In well, all of his stuff. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he never had any formal education in machine shop or tool and die. It I wasn't at all so. pretty much self-taught. Self-taught. In, in fact, uh, more remarkable than that is he's able to conceive complex firearms mechanisms without the benefit of any engineering or things like metallurgy, which you mm -hmm. would appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, he had no uh, strength of materials training or engineering training of any kind. It was amazing that he was able to conceive something as sophisticated as a floating chamber. Well, I'll tell you, um, we have in the collection a mixed bag of, of early floating chambers and short stroke pistons, and the first stuff he would work in wood we have wood receivers with a wood carrier and a wood bolt, and he would make the hand carve these things out of wood with, with, with the lugs on the bolt to see if it would go through the function cycle. I and if he could that. do it out of wood and make it work, then he would go to metal. But he made his first stuff just hand carved out of wood. So hey, we have in the collection wood receivers. They have a wood bolt and a wood bolt carrier, maybe a wood feed block. The bolt has lugs and the receiver has receiving slots and he would do this to see if this system, this invention, the bolt would go through the function cycle, if it would work. And if it would work in wood, then he'd go ahead and make it in metal. Are the wooden parts finished with the same degree of attention to detail as the metal parts? Exactly. I would think so. Yeah, he would. And, and we have, I don't know, half a dozen of them and there's, some of them is pretty strange stuff. A little bizarre. Uh, the the, the um, the lugs 
and the interrupted threads on the bolt that then fit into the bolt carrier are different than what you normally see in, in modern. He was doing interrupted threads in wood? Interrupted threads in wood. And they're all very, very even. And I don't know how in the world he measured that sort of thing. That is amazing. I mean, it's difficult enough to cut an interrupted thread anyway. Yeah. But to carve it in wood and expect it to, you know, to, to last through a function test of any kind is mm -hmm. kind of remarkable. Anyway, back to the lathe itself. This was one of, of course, I guess, one of his primary, naturally one of his primary machine tools, probably yeah, the was. one he used the most. And he certainly kept it in perfect condition, as is yeah. evident from he kept clean the All of his tools clean. This is a, a South Bend metal turning lathe. Mm -hmm. And you see the lathe dogs and... Uh, you got a dead center here and a four jaw chuck and it's six foot bed on this i would believe a six foot bed yeah those ways are about six foot well and when we were filming back in uh, it was a winter early winter of 66 he was actually using this lathe to turn the the barrel portion of his prototype machine gun that he was working on at the time and uh we shot a lot of footage of him you know working the uh, metal and everything he was just as careful turning that dummy prototype as he would be in working on a finished piece. I think he was a very meticulous workman. Yes, he was. He was, he was a truly a craftsman and a mechanical genius. It was quite a gift. His, um, his ability to, to perceive mechanical principles uh, relating to firearms the way he was able to was a uh, true genius because I mean, when you think about it, all of the firearm designers doing semi-automatic design from the turn of the century on had not stumbled on two uh, very innovative systems that he came up with. And of course, the floating chamber was probably the most widely used of his systems. And uh, the short stroke piston was probably the most widely produced mm -hmm. of his systems, but it was mm -hmm. only used in one gun that I know of. Mm -hmm. And that was the M1 carbine. Yeah, We have a number of the floating chambers that uh, the metal ones that he was turning out Maybe we have about 15 or 20 of them, and they're all slightly different. He so, made that system work with virtually every kind of firearm um, there was, including uh, shotguns and uh, pistols, uh, machine guns, rifles, just about anything that used a cartridge and, and uh, shot either semi-automatically or automatically, he made work with the floating chamber. Yeah. That was his big invention. That was uh, the thing that he really should be famous for, more so than the short stroke piston, yeah. which was also very innovative. Well, we hold uh, copies of all his patents. Well, I'm not going to say all. I don't know that they're all, but there, there's over 50 of them. Yeah, and 58. he has patents and everything. Yeah, 58. And uh, slings, sling swivels, uh, ejectors, extractors, all sorts of strange sight systems. Uh, he, was, he was not only just into the guts of a firearm, he was doing things for stock design, all he sorts was, of different uh, he patents. He was a very amazing individual. I think my favorite of all of William's guns that he fired for us that day was the 22 caliber belt fed machine gun, which is now uh, on display in the shop at the Museum of History in Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. All right. What we're looking at here is, of course, the famous uh, belt fed 22 caliber machine gun that was uh, designed and built by Carbine Williams in the late 30s. Late 30s, yeah. We have some ordnance photographs. The oldest, oldest thing we have in the archives are ordnance photographs showing this gun, and they're dated, I believe, in 1939. But he worked on it all the way through the 40s and going into the 50s. He told me that he thought it was a um, good idea, practical idea, to throw out a lot of lead for waves, wave attacks. And the faster you could fire, you'd break up the wave attacks. I think he was thinking about Korea and places like that. Interestingly enough, that idea has uh, been in the military mind since, since the history of repeating weapons and was tried in other ways. That uh, basic concept was originally probably the, um, the idea of the Pedersen device. Yes. Which fired 40 right. rounds of uh, pistol ammunition through a full-size service rifle, yeah. lay down fields of fire. When we had the opportunity to shoot this, shoot pictures of this gun firing in 1966, it was amazing because it was incredibly reliable. It never jammed, even though it was shooting rimfire ammunition. It was 100% dependable, no matter what you were putting through it, whether it be tracers or high speed or anything else. I was going to ask you about that. Is there such a thing as a 22 tracer? That would be yeah. a new cartridge to we me. We found several cartons of it uh, for the Fort Bragg demonstration. Okay. We used that. Oh. Boy, was it impressive. Not the, sure. it, it was just, the bullets were practically coming out about 10 feet apart. Yeah, 
and uh, just laying down little uh, uh, flaming bits as it traveled down range. It was very impressive. This is an awful thick barrel for 22. I had assumed that the reason for the, the thickness of the barrel was one, weight to hold it down in the automatic fire, but two, it would not heat up as fast. The as heating part is barrel. what he had in mind, that and to duplicate the weight of the 30 caliber gun. Uh, as far as the size of the barrel, when you consider that it's mounted with a pentel up front and the elevating and traversing mechanism at the back, any size barrel would have been stable as far as the movement of the gun. Uh, keep in mind, a 30 caliber machine gun with a relatively light barrel was also fitted to these same tripods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it would have been that wouldn't have been the problem. I think he had in mind weight and heat dissipation. Heat dissipation. Yeah, that was this my one, guess. by the way, is uh, the seventh one that he built. The other six were bought by the government, and nobody has heard anything from them since. But he made one for himself, and uh, it was a fascinating weapon. It indeed worked very well, as did all of his stuff. Do you know? that he was ever able to finish or put into production the submachine gun variation of this system. They were working on the prototype, actually pre-prototype of that gun using the mechanism or the same type of mechanism of this gun uh, when we were filming back in 66. And uh, I don't know, I don't believe that they ever finished a working model of it, but they made up dummies uh, just for appearance sake. It was a rather radical looking weapon to say the least. I've only seen one dummy that was all solid and the archives does have a number of drawings of the firearm but it is the basic, new. The basic idea and what they were kind of playing with was an idea of a handheld belt fed submachine gun that would hold a large quantity of 22 rim fire ammunition and a kind of uh, box magazine configuration mounted on the side of the gun. And at one point, I understand they were thinking about trying to develop a paper belt that would hold uh, several hundred rounds of ammunition and could be chopped off with a shearing device mounted to the bottom of the gun. This apparently was never done, but it was one of the thoughts. One of the thoughts. I had not heard that. When, when, when he was talking to me about it, he said something about an ordinary cloth belt that would go under your arm and into this huge backpack. I remember them talking about the backpack too. They, I think the reason they were certainly considering that was they knew that would work mm -hmm. uh, without question because it would uh, use existing uh, uh, parts and yeah. technology. Yeah. Well, the idea of a paper belt is revolutionary. I've never heard of such a concept. That would, if it worked, if it had worked, it would have revolutionized certain aspects of, uh, you know, like uh, guard weapons and yes. riot control weaponry and stuff like that. Throw out some serious lead in a quick hurry. Mm -hmm. For security purposes, we don't have the bolt, the bolt carrier, or the feed block in this receiver. There, we keep those separate. Um, usually in the museum, the ammunition you see around here is all unloaded, and the firearms don't have their strikers. For a shooter and a gun collector and an admirer of Williams' work, actually getting to fire this rare prototype 30 6 version of the carbine was a real thrill for me. Probably the first time it's been picked up in years. 20 years or more. This rare prototype rifle is a full-size version of the basic mechanism that operates the famous 30 caliber M1 carbine, except this one is in 30 6 full military size uh, caliber. This was a very interesting weapon, and we were fortunate enough to get to actually fire this during our filming back in 1966. It worked well, but I got the impression that I was shooting a carbine in slow motion. Everything seemed to be scaled down as far as the speed, uh, the way the uh, breech worked, and the way the shells came out and everything. It looked to me like it was hammering you. You said it wasn't that bad? Oh, well, I was just very light and, and okay. kind of spooky at the time. <laughs> It was, uh, I, I should have been a little more sophisticated about it, and if I were 55 years old like I am today, I would be, you know, much, much more cool and laid back. Um, this barrel looks like it's shorter than the M1 barrel. Do you think it is? Yes, probably is somewhat. Um, in fact, I was trying to see if maybe he had made it from a Springfield, but 
he probably used a barrel blank, an existing barrel mm -hmm. blank of some kind to make it, especially if he made six. You say you think he made as many as six of I these? I think there's something in the back of my memory that I have seen six or I have heard of six, but the, the number six for the, the total number of these is, is in my mind somewhere. I may stand corrected, but hmm. there's certainly more than just this one. Oh, would, would you care to sell it? I'm, How I'm much would you give it for? I'll give you $100. $100, yeah. Attorney General would love that. <laughs> Is that, that serrated lever in front of the trigger guard, is that magazine release, I think? Either that or CS, that would be. That's a magazine, magazine release. release. Yeah, incidentally, you notice this thing has got markings on it here. Have you ever seen this? No, I've looked close at the thing, tried to pick it there, up. There's a marking. No, there's, uh, so well, there's 7147. Now, that's our museum accession number. Oops. That shows that it came in 1971. Uh, it's the 40th collection to come in that year, and this is item number seven in the Williams collection. Okay. So much for the idea that Williams might have put a secret mark on there that Hello? we could be th Hello. talking about. Look at the safety. Isn't that a 17 struck in that safety right there? There's a mark. It is, indeed. Yeah. Which is kind of strange because I can't understand why he would mark just the safety, and it looks like it was stamped with a machine stamp rather than a hand stamp. Mm -hmm. You're right. Which makes me wonder if maybe this isn't off of some other weapon, but I can't, I don't recognize it. I can't it. buy that. That's a very individual and singular safety system. Could be. You notice the typical of Williams' work is the fit of the wood, wood. and the finish of the wood yeah. and everything. Marvelous work with yeah. Wood, he? he treated each piece, even his uh, his prototypes, as if they were finished, custom-built rifles to be sold to a client or something. Oh, it's got a stacking swivel on it. Yeah. A bayonet lug. Looks yeah, like it looks like he had in mind a full military approach yeah, to this like thing. Blown up Craig. You know, this gun could have competed with the Garand, and I think that had his timing been better, uh, he might have stood a chance of having this in the service. Mm -hmm. uh, the rifle works very well. It's probably relatively cheap to make, or it would have been. Um, not as much as some guns they use today, but it was still, you know, it used a short stroke piston, which lends itself to uh, economic um, production. What's the size of that magazine? 30 rounds, you think? No, it's 20. 20. Okay. Yeah, it's too short for 30. Okay. And plus a 30, although this magazine looks shorter than the one I recall, but. It's my imagination playing tricks. 20 would be as many as you would want to have in a rifle of this size because a 30 round magazine would be rather cumbersome and it would start to get in the way. It would hang down like this. In a small gun like an AK-47 or something, it's okay, but in a big gun like this, it would be uh, probably a problem. I just thought of something as you had that thing turned around. He liked the C-type stock. Yeah. Yes, he did. That was his favorite. And that's a carryover from the way stocks were made around the turn of the century. That was uh, a lot of the military weapons had those kind of stocks. Yeah, with a pistol grip on the small there. I'm going to take a look at the butt plate. Looks like a piece of aluminum, doesn't it? Now, that, that is strange because the butt plate, is, as beautiful as the rest of the gun is, the butt plate is comparatively crude. Crude and ordinary. Yeah, you can see machine marks in it. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not finished down and it's not anodized or finished off or anything. But it was a fascinating gun. It was, uh, it was fun to shoot this thing. And uh, had the Garand not already been adopted by the, force, uh, the armed forces when he built these, this would have been a, a good stout competitor yeah, for, for adoption by the services. I agree. They'd have to change that safety. Probably would. That would have been an unhandy safety for a military person. Relatively easy thing to deal with, though. They would have found a lot of ways to cheapen it to make it easier to manufacture. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, this one is a real beaut. I'm just not used to seeing a receiver ring without a mark on it anywhere. It is kind of scary. It's strange. <laughs> you get the impression somebody took something and ground it off. <laughs> but uh, I guess the others were unmarked too. I'm surprised that he liked to mark things. I mean, he liked to have his, like the machine gun over there, number seven. It's yeah. detailed markings that panographed in there. Yeah, I'm surprised that he didn't. Mark these things. I'm curious about the next step, like the M2, make this thing into full automatic rather than semi. It would have been very unhandy to shoot this as an M2. It would have been almost uncontrollable. Yeah. It would have been. Uh, Couldn't hold it down. It, it, it would have been pretty awkward. Uh, you notice that when they, um, in the 30 06 military cartridge, you rarely saw truly handheld service rifles that were rigged up for full auto until they got to the M14 which used an expansion cutoff gas system and a somewhat smaller, lighter cartridge. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the old days, you didn't see 30 6 rifles generally made in full auto. That's excluding the BAR, which was a bipod light machine gun approach. You know? yeah.
a nice gun, Keith. Like I say, I'll buy it from you anytime. After we finished shooting the exhibits in the shop itself, Keith took us out and opened up some of the exhibits under glass in the hall. Why don't we take a look at uh, the upper rifle? Yeah, a 22 autoloader that he made about 1925. Indeed, and it was the uh, first Caledonia rifle. I believe it, it is, and I, I believe he told me that the uh, stock was a, a fence post. It was the best piece of wood. Post. Walnut fence post. Back in the days when you could make fence posts out of black walnut. Is there any chance of taking this down? No, it's up there pretty permanently on those hooks to keep it from vibrating off or keeping it from getting, it lo getting loose. Well, when we uh, worked uh, on the film work in 1966, uh, Harry Joyner and I both had a chance to fire this little rifle. And we were told that it was the first uh, Caledonia prison gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found it to be uh, a very elegant little automatic 22. It was... Uh... Well, you showed me that film, and when it was being fired, I could not see that bolt operating. I think Williams, uh, in the process of designing the floating chamber, was still uh, unaware of its full potential. And the, the action in this rifle cycles so rapidly that it would open and close between frames of movie film. I believe you're right. You, you can't see it work. That's 24 frames a second. And yeah. It would open and close between two of those. You know. But uh, that was a wonderful little rifle. And uh, it eventually led, I well, suppose, the first thing you do is this one. You... Yeah, that is my understanding. A kind of prototype of That's the right. floating chamber. That's uh, right. This part right there, you know, the throw. Of it. Yes. And this subsequently became the Remington 550 through one more prototype. Through one more. This one was made in 1927. And he stated that he'd used a Model T Ford truck axle for the barrel. I wonder how he drilled the hole. How did he drill the hole and how did he rifle it? That's very interesting because the tooling required to do that is pretty specialized. Yeah. And you can't get a long Kmart drill bit, that's for sure. Notice how these tools are finished. He uh, made these things and finished them off and the, the, the wood is beautiful in there. And the, the, the quality of something as simple as an axe head. You can pick that one up with the gloves. Yeah, so they can see how shiny and... Isn't that nice? I mean, nice work? Just way over designed I mean for something as simple as this the craftsmanship is is truly remarkable and not only that it's somewhat sharp too this would still work it would do the job so would those knives they they do they look like very fine like they kind of reminiscent of uh, German um, dress daggers or yes something. yeah he was that's the title of this case a craftsman we're, we're trying to show these items to show just how good a craftsman he really was and i we're always impressed with the finish on those handles yeah that is it's quite remarkable is that leather in there uh, laminated into the handle? either leather or stone i think it might be stone it's amazing this bottom rifle of course is the probably the most recognized of the caledonia prison camp weapons this one was the 35 Remington um, short barrel rifle that was actually used in the movie Carbine Williams starring Jimmy Stewart in the title role. All my automatic guns operate on, uh, is an actuator that operates a very short distance, say around a tenth of an inch or less. And this one here operates <coughs> with a short stroke too. There's the part that work, operates this gun. It just moves, I'd say, about 40 thousandths or 50 thousandths of an inch. Now, before you made this, uh, how much did the uh, previous guns move? Oh, they were, they were uh, I'd say they'd move about uh, from three to three and a quarter inches. And so this, uh, or better. Yeah, this helps make uh, the gun uh, automatic. That's right. Sir. That's what operates the gun right there. And the bolt mechanism locks into this. This is an extension thing, yeah, the bolt locks into that. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you made this uh, carbine out of. What, what, uh, for instance, uh, material did you use there? Well, now, this part that the barrel screws in used to be uh, an old Ford uh, crankshaft. That's where I got this, this part right there, you know, the throw. Mm -hmm. 
And this part here, this barrel screwed into, uh, was the main bearing. So that's a lot of forward in that. Oh, it's all forward. <laughs> <Back. laughs> all right, fine. Now, uh, looking at the other part there, uh, what did you uh, make that out of? Just any old thing you pick up. But it's steel. Like, uh, we had plenty of steel that I work with, as far as steel goes. So it's just two steel of various kinds. Now, uh, where did you store this while you were working on it? Well, this particular gun, the reason it's so short is uh, I'd keep it hid in a wall. And the, the shop was made of uh, a wooden building. And I'd have it, the, the shop, I'd have a board fixed so I could take it out and hide it. And Captain Peebles didn't know, to start off with, he didn't know exactly what I was doing. But uh, we got along a little better later on. and. <laughs> I can imagine the state prison system probably found, uh, frowned on one of the inmates uh, making a rifle. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Can that one be handled? Yes, you can pick that one up off the Lucite holders. Okay. I'll very carefully pick that up. This is a pretty mean-looking thing, sort of like a, a vintage assault rifle. I noticed for the first time that it's marked number one on the, on the frame. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When uh, we were fortunate enough to get Carbine Williams to actually fire this weapon for us, and uh, it was interesting, it jammed, and he was obviously very upset about that, and we were told later that he went back in the shop that night and worked on it and fixed it, but he never fired it again for us. Yeah. But I have a feeling that it works better now than, than it did that day when we were shooting him. It's a heavy little thing, isn't it? It is. It's, it's substantial and chunky. And With a sling swivel up forward. And a very small and sling. And a tiny swivel. one. It's almost like it's there for cosmetics rather than for carrying it around. Probably is. Probably is because there's no rear sling swivel. You notice the marks in the... Uh, yeah, and I, I, I don't know what they're for. I can't there's explain There's some significance that. there, and I can't sure. remember what they... Uh, That's deliberate. Yeah. Oh, look, bad chip there. I'm sure it was though. I didn't do that. You just, I, where's the chip on the deck right well, now? I would die if I found it down there. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can get this back in its place just like you had it. That looked about right? Yeah, I believe that's correct. And it just rolls over. Okay, good. This is the uh, Craftsman cabinet. Craftsman case, Showing right. some of his finer workmanship and uh, early prototypes. And him at the milling machine. And you believe that he built this... Uh, this machine, uh, this machine, this rifle at um, Caledonia? Mm-hmm, 1927. That's what he told us. That's strange, because I, I was always under the impression that there were three Caledonia guns instead of four. Hmm, interesting. Okay, can we move on to something else? We can go to the inventor case behind you. Okay. This uh, exhibit is uh, some of the inventor's models from uh, William's uh, collection. Yes, we have the... Blow forward. Every gun inventor likes the idea of working with a system instead of having the action run backwards. And this one, the action runs forward from the standing breech. Did you ever talk to Williams about this gun? Did he ever admit shooting it or no. say anything about it? No, I, I spoke to him about it, but I don't remember. That was, golly sakes, 25 years ago. It? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a heavy thing again. This one is very heavy and... Uh, I believe you made this in about 1928, and it's in 30 six. As you can see, you got the detail on this? The barrel will move forward as the weapon fires. And the standing breech remains solid. The breech solid. Is, is still and fixed. A very interesting and beautifully made piece, but I really wonder if it works. I can't help but wonder if it works. We could not get Williams to shoot this gun. He showed it to us and he demonstrated how it works, but he would not fire it. I got the impression that it wasn't his favorite. But it is a nice looking piece, isn't it? Mm -hmm. This next one is a 22 Remington 550. This was the first one and that became a very popular 22 rifle. Um, I've had several of these in the production form. This was the um, 
the famous, oh, look at that. It has a an interesting locking system of sorts there. Mm -hmm. I, oh, that's the floating chamber. That's the floating yeah, chamber. I've never seen it done that way. This, uh, this rifle was a prototype of the now famous Remington 550. And uh, I remember in the advertising brochures in the old days, uh, Remington advertised this weapon as, we'll shoot shorts, longs, and long rifles interchangeably and without adjustment. And this was the prototype built uh, probably by hand in William's shop. Yeah, in the um, 30s. Notice it's got the box magazine of Remington in the production model, he, the tubular. He, he did prefer clip-fed magazines for some reason. And, of course, all the manufacturers were using the tubular magazines in their auto loaders from that period. I think but every American farm in 1954 had one of these just about at the everybody house. had them. It was a very popular weapon. Very good. Yeah. Very nice. Here's an ace conversion, but it's the, the prototype you see on this back wall with a 45 1911 A1. And here's the, the 22 barrel and the floating chamber we have. This is, an, uh, this is a cold service ace. As you can see, it is a 20, it's a 22 caliber. The 22 long rifle caliber, but it's on a 45 frame. Well, in order to make a gun work of this heavy slide and go the same distance that the 45 goes, you must have uh, some means of increasing the operating energy enough, or say equivalent to the recoil of a 45. Well. This barrel in here is 22 caliber, and this is the forward. This is the barrel proper, and um, what makes this thing operate is a movable chamber. This little piece here, and it sits right in the rear end of the barrel, and the slide rests against the rear portion of this movable chamber, and moving this short distance, which is around 50 thousandths of an inch or something like that. The slide resting against it, you get that strong push or impact necessary to open the gun the long distance through which it travels. And you get a considerable amount of disturbance when you shoot this gun due to the fact that it sets up a, as much operating energy as a 45, the recoil of a 45. And it ain't like shooting an ordinary 22. You get a great bit of. Uh, you're more custom, we'll say, when you're shooting a 45 after you shoot this than if it didn't have all that energy. And it was adopted by the Army and is used for training, and of course, it's the civilian shooters, of course, they went for it too. And it's proved out a very popular gun. But I'll bet yeah. you the serial number is nine. On the pistol? Mm -hmm. Might very well be. I believe he shot that gun for us. Uh, in 66, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he said it was serial nine, and I remember seeing that. Here's the uh, drafting kit, I believe, Sears. And his mom bought that from Sears and sent it to him when he was at Caledonia. And I think we can show this, pick this up and show it like that. Isn't that remarkable? It's gonna, look at the detail workmanship yeah. on the drawing, and it was drawn on the back of a shoe box. Shoe box, and it's dated 1922. But if that's the only thing you have to draw on, well, that's what, what you're going to use. It just goes to show you it's, uh, it's not what you have to work with, it's what you know. Mm -hmm. Put that back there like that, and I believe... The, uh, the carbine that you have on display there, that is the one that he uh, was so proud of because it had been um, signed by, I think, MacArthur's signature is on it somewhere. Mark there. Clark, Mark Jimmy Clark. Stewart, there's about half a dozen signatures on there. I'm not sure if this is the one we actually fired in his shop. I somehow think that it was not. The one that we fired in the, uh, out the shop window was an unmarked prototype that he got from Winchester. This one, I believe, is marked as a legitimate production. This barrel shows the, the principle of the short stroke piston. Interestingly enough, uh, we shot a lengthy take in 66 uh, of uh, Carbine Williams with a pair of needle nose pliers. Uh, sh just demonstrating for me the short stroke principle with that barrel. And that piston moves about a quarter of an inch? Less than that. Less More than like that? a tenth of an inch. Wow. In the production, in the carving, a tenth of an inch. Yeah. It, any distance would work because it does its job and, and is, is done. So you could do an eighth of an inch and uh, 
it would make little difference. But it was a fascinating principle, and it worked well in uh, many, many different designs. Even this Model 50 Winchester shotgun, which uses a floating chamber principle. One of the big things that the floating chamber does in a gun of this size, and you don't normally need floating chamber principles incorporated in center fire large weapons like this, but what it does is it allows you to make the barrel fixed to the receiver so that the barrel itself doesn't have to recoil with the, the moving parts. Only gas-operated guns in this type of weapon can do that. Mm -hmm. The other ones, the barrel used to go the full, almost the full length of the breech travel. Yeah. And then I come along and not trying to brag about it all, but the world waited about 50 years before this gun, this year particular gun was designed. This gun here, the Model 50 and the Featherweight 50 and the, and the 59 Winchester. And it, I, can, I could plainly see when I tackled this job, uh, what a job it must have been for somebody to even try. It was the hardest design job that I ever tried in my life. Uh, it looked like nothing wouldn't get right about it. Everything was wrong. The only thing that didn't give any trouble to start with was the movable, my movable chamber. It would always operate perfectly, but to get a suitable feed mechanism and the ease of loading and all like that, uh, it's a very easy gun to load, and it doesn't even have a strong magazine spring. It is also very light and easy, easy to load when your fingers are cold and such things and unload. And another thing about it is it handles all shells, the lightest shells and the heaviest shells. Any kind of shell you put in it with no, you don't have to adjust it any way, whatever. And while well, Browning, the Browning automatic shotgun is a mighty nice gun, no question about that. But you did have to adjust it for light and heavy loads. And of course, some people to get one, they were not acquainted or aware of that fact, and they would have trouble. But you have none of that in this gun. And one more, another thing, it, uh, it has about 20%, apparently, uh, what I mean, the recoil that you can feel. You have about 20% uh, reduction in the recoil that comes to your shoulder. It's spread over a long period of time. Uh, for, while this uh, mechanism is coming back, it absorbs quite a bit of it. It's a very pleasant gun to shoot. It don't give you that real hard stinging kick like a double barrel or some gun, or a pump gun for that. And down here, of course, is uh, the basic conversion kit for the Browning 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun. Uh, Williams made for a while, or designed, a, uh, a 22 caliber conversion kit. And if I'm not mistaken, this gun uses a... Uh, regular 30 caliber belt loaded with steel inserts that are the same size as the regular 30-06 cartridge but there's a 22 rim fire round inserted into each insert and then the floating chamber principle takes over and makes these heavier parts work with lightweight 22 ammunition and the government used that for training purposes. I believe you're right notice the face of the bolt and the striker sticking through is 30-06 so mm -hmm. the cartridge is going to be rimless 30 out 6 and the striker is going to probably be hitting high for the rim fire rather than dead it's, center it's for 30 out exactly 6. Exactly right. I hadn't thought about that, but that's indeed the way it would be. We used to get those inserts all the time. You'd, they would sell them as government surplus and you'd find them by the thousands. I've seen one of these guns work and, and it did function well, but at a very slow cyclic rate, which surprised me. And, um, but I understand it did not work as well as the belt fed 22 that we yeah, examined. That's true. And besides, who is the poor clown that's going to be told to load the 22 long rifles into the insert cases? That must have been a chore. A chore. And, and uh, one thing about it is that it, if, if they would tend to fall out if there was nothing to hold them in. Mm -hmm. They were just a hole. And I, I think they relied on the fact that you don't normally fire a machine gun straight up in the air. Otherwise, it would have been a mess. This was the inventor's, this the inventor the cabinet. Inventor case, right. That's probably Williams with executives at Winchester, I would think. Exactly, exactly. And I'm going to tell you, late 40s by the clothing? It looks like, well, of course, Williams wore that suit up in the 60s. That's true. That's the same suit he, he liked, wore at, he liked that at suit. Uh, Fort Bragg. Pinstripe. Yeah. With high top shoes. I didn't even know you could buy those anymore, but he had them on. They were like new. 
course, knowing him, he could have bought them in 1920 and they would still be in that condition. That's true. I believe this is uh, the little gun that he made when he was a child, about 10 years old. Yes, and it actually fires. Uh, it's a reed barrel that's wrapped so it won't burst, and he used black powder, used a match head for a primer. Isn't it interesting that at the age of 10, he had figured out the necessity for wrapping the barrel with uh, string to uh, make it possible to hold a charge? Give it more strength, yes. yeah. And what is the gun, or the, <laughs> I wouldn't call it a gun, but the thing on top? Well, it's a toy. It's something he carved uh, when he was even younger. I think something like, I don't know, six years old. Uh, it's non-functional, just a wood toy with a nail for a trigger and a piece of wire for a trigger guard. Looks like he was establishing his destiny as far back as six years old. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's the oldest thing we have. I mean, he kept everything. He was a real pack rat. Yeah. Carbine, tell us about this wooden pistol you made when you were 10 or 11 years old. Well, this is it right there. The stock is made out of juniper wood, and the barrel is made out of a reed. And as you can see, the pivot point there is a nail drove through it come through over there and filed off and the hammer's wood and the face and the striking part of the hammer there is another nail drove in and the head hits the back of the reed and on the back of the reed you use an old-fashioned the tip end of an old-fashioned match head and that serves as a cap and of course as you very well see it's a muzzle loader and to keep it uh, from bare from bursting, and it's wrapped with strong fishing line, and it makes a pretty strong setup when once you go around that many times. And um, well, the first thing you do is to put your powder in there, and you take a 22 long rifle cartridge, and an empty one, and you take two of those full of black powder, and that's the charge. Two empty long rifle cartridges, the shed, the empty shells, you know, and that, that's the charge. And then you take a little bit of newspaper for wadding and put down over your powder, and you, then you put your suitable size buckshot in there and, and another little wadding. By that time, you've got a lethal weapon there. Oh, yes, it'll shoot. <laughs> What's the range on it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, last time I shot it, uh, it was at Fort Bragg, and it made quite a pound. All right, we'll try it out here, right now. Well, it certainly put a hole through there, I'll tell you that. Well, that was a pretty good demonstration. Oh, yes, yes. It, it, went, all, it went through the first board anyway, and it did uh, just not an automatic, you know. It's just a single shot, you know. Nobody would be afraid of it. Remember on the third trip up there when we were called upon to accompany Williams and his entourage to uh, Fort Bragg for a demonstration of the 22 machine gun before the uh, special forces uh, troops there? Well, I'm having trouble remembering lunch this afternoon, but if I stretch my memory a little bit, I, I, I remember making the trip, but... I, well, I remember he, he got decked out in his best pinstripe suit. 30-year-old suit. Yeah, and his stets in the hat. I mean, he really looked great. And he was very excited about this. He's, he's, a, good, uh, he's a good performer in many ways. Uh, perhaps performer is not the right word, but he has no compunctions about getting up in front of a group of people. Uh, and he's very articulate about uh, explaining his equipment or his ideas or yeah. his ideals. He is a natural, I think. And the demonstration at Bragg went very well. It, it, anyone watching that gun work would have had to have been impressed. Uh, I, really, I was stunned. It was much, much later when I discovered that the government did not buy his, uh, his new gun. I, I was really amazed that they didn't buy it because of its firepower and its, well, all of its attributes. Well, I'll tell you this, if they had incorporated that mechanism into a submachine gun, you would have seen one hell of a pack of firepower there. It would have been devastating because it could have held, you know, hundreds of rounds of ammunition since it was so light. Well, I was impressed with the fact that when he fired it, as we saw a few minutes ago, it literally dug a ditch from the muzzle of the gun all the way to the tank on one occasion. A continuous ditch. Yeah. Which means it's firing fast. Yes, that thing had a cyclic rate of, uh, gee, I think it was something like, 
1,800 rounds a minute or 3,000 rounds a minute, something like that. It was very fast. Like I say, it was my favorite piece of all of them. I enjoyed watching that weapon work. Well, it was a fascinating piece of equipment, even for those of us who are not gun-oriented. Williams would very patiently explain the operation of the gun to each and every soldier who came up with a question. Well, he would do likewise for a visitor at his house. It didn't matter who, the, who, who asked a question, he would always get an answer. Probably the most gentle and elegant side of this complex man's life was his charming, lovely wife, Miss Maggie. She was the perfect hostess, and this genteel woman did everything she could to make our visit comfortable. She, in many ways, was a highlight to our trip uh, each time we went. Uh, she was always there to be sure we had a cup of coffee or something to drink, and she was a delightful individual and also a delightful break in the, uh, in the business that we had to do when we were filming Carbide. You know, I don't think many people realize that Williams uh, was a, a relatively learned man, uh, a man who read and who liked history and poetry and things like that. It seems such a contrast to the, uh, the, the, his past history and the business that he was in, designing of uh, firearms, you know, the merchant of death syndrome. But he was a, a, a sensitive and, uh, and uh, informed man. I got the feeling that Williams was somewhat awkward at reliving the past and, uh, and looking at the remnants of, uh, of his heyday. Indeed, uh, during the period of time that uh, he had a, a fistful of cash, he had had these uh, paintings commissioned of himself and Miss Maggie. And they're, they're good paintings. I, I don't know who the artist was, but they really do uh, show the character of those two individuals. It was sort of a, just a hint of opulence in his otherwise modest home. Indeed, and in fact, the two paintings were hung in an empty room. That's true. Remember the famous Sunday dinner? It was famous? Well, it wasn't famous, but it was a Sunday dinner. I remember Miss Maggie's cooking. I don't remember the day of the week, but I can remember that but lady's cooking. I remember it was a, a, a almost formal, elegant uh, dinner setting. Sunday, I believe. The machine gun was a fascinating piece, and I could not... Uh, I, I could not bear not to do a second editing of the footage that we had earlier. You'll notice it's basically the same footage, but all of these shots are quite different from different angles from the original ones. That's true. I wish we had shot a scene behind the target when we did the, uh, the fixed shot where all 50 rounds of ammunition went into a hole about the size of a penny. I wish we had photographed that. Unfortunately, we do have the penny fitting in the hole. We have the hole. <laughs> we, we have the whole. In concluding our presentation of the weapons of Carbine Williams, Harry and I wanted to show you a rare and unique glimpse of a carbine at work. With this special camera designed for high-speed motion picture photography, we hope to get an interesting look at a 30 caliber carbine functioning on full automatic fire. We've taken the stock off the gun and detailed the parts in white so that you'll be able to see them move better on film. The result should be an analysis motion picture showing the mechanism working at about 150th of its normal speed. Ready? Okay, I am going to switch on. And leave it on. Okay. One, two. One, two, three, bang. bang. Okay. Ready? I'm ready. Palmer, you ready? Ready. One, two, three, bang. I have no idea who started first. But I know who finished first. You did. Appreciate the win. Uh-huh. Okay. One, two, three.
I would su strongly suggest you not do that. Okay, good. One, two, three. You know, watching this in extreme slow motion, it's like almost like watching a ballet. A ballet of firepower. A bullet ballet. A bullet ballet. <laughs> bullet ballet. <laughs> the weapon is actually firing uh, about 15 shots in a one second frame, time frame. You can see the uh, operating slide tripping the sear trip lever, which in turn trips the disconnector, which in turn releases the hammer, which in turn fires the weapon. It amazes me that at that speed you can actually see some of the mechanism wobble. That's characteristic of high speed photography. Uh, little harmonics and things like that are often set up. But the weapon is working reliably, as they all did. The little white marks are on there, by the way, so that you can see it better while it's moving. It just helps to focus your attention on the moving parts. Well, they sure are ugly. They're white. <laughs> Couldn't see the bullet. We thought we might be able to catch a shot of a slug coming out, but the camera wasn't shooting quite fast enough. Even at 8,000 frames a second, at one, one eight no, thousandth of a second, no. you still can't see a bullet. We're running, the camera's actually running at 4,000 frames a second. That's 100 feet of film in a second. As I was saying, even at 4,000 frames a second, a 4,000th of a second, you can't see the bullet. You are a technical genius in every possible way. Unequivocally. You can almost read the head stamp on those shells as they come out. Well, look at those, some of those things just barely make it clear in time. Yeah, it's almost as if it were underwater. Yeah. Although I rather imagine the uh, underwater, it would react differently. I think uh, like a, a blue Danube waltz would go well with this or something in it. Any color waltz would go well. <laughs> I've always been fascinated with one. I've never seen this actually done this way before. Uh, I mean, I've always known how it worked, but I've just never actually seen it work. Most of the time, you have to have the stock on the gun to hold the parts together. You know, when Williams cut his deal with Winchester, he received an inordinate amount of money, considering we're talking $1940 here. His one lump sum settlement was 238000 plus. However, little did Williams, or probably Winchester for that matter, know at the time that this little gun would be produced in such vast quantities. As it turned out, over eight million were produced, and had Williams asked for a commission of 50 cents a gun, he would have ended up a multi-millionaire from this piece alone. What was that, $270,000? 238, 238 and change. That's not too shabby in 1992. I didn't think so either. I mean, uh, he got an extremely high percentage of the first um, contract of 80,000 guns. Williams got a commission of like 26% or something like that, a huge commission. but. He got the commission based on a contract from the U.S. government for 80,000 pieces. Later on, 10 times that many would end up being made by some eight or nine Different contractors. Yeah. Probably one of the most successful military firearms uh, ever produced, and probably the most, uh, I would say, produced in the most quantities of just about anything ever built. How do we get out of this bit? I don't know. I could just fire a brief burst into the ceiling. That would, that would do something. This tribute to Carbine Williams wouldn't be complete without recognizing those who gave us freely of their time and knowledge. Without their assistance, this project could not have been finished.
chain gang. Perhaps you still have some uh, very bad memories of those days. Oh, yes. Uh, when I hit the uh, uh, state's prison around 1921, 2021, and long in there, uh, it was pretty rough, I'll tell you right now. People wore chains, and if you were in C grade, that means the stripes went around, and you could wear chains. And if you were in B grade, the stripes run up and down. And when you were in A grade, you didn't wear stripes at all. But you couldn't wear chains when you were in any grade except C grade. And that was as low as you could go. And when you were in C grade, they could do anything to you, just about. Did they beat you? Oh, yes. Uh, there was a lot of that going on. Well, I know, Carbine, that uh, in the movie story of your life, Jimmy Stewart played uh, the part of you. Uh, were you the quiet type like Jimmy Stewart, or were you a pretty uh, rough character in your younger days? Well... Uh, not that I'm trying to brag about anything, but I was considered on, uh, I wasn't hard to get along with, but I just didn't want to be fooled with and pushed around. And I didn't take much foolishness. Well, I guess that you ran up against a lot of uh, hard types in uh, prison, too, didn't you? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, if, well, the ones that were considered on the rough side, why... They won't necessarily, what you, they, they won't uh, just low down thieves. They were mostly killers and such like that. And they got them together and Captain Peoples had them in the final analysis on Caledonia in Camp Number 2, which is where I was and where I made these guns. And, uh, that's they, where they sent a lot of the hard cases down That's where Caledonia. they all went to. They sorted them out and sent them there. Well, being in prison even though you weren't the ty kind of person to take any foolishness. Being in prison changed your life. Well, it, uh, it's possible, yes. It, it, it's, I reckon so. But uh, not uh, there again, I'm not trying to say anything good about him or anything, but one thing that put me over with Captain Peoples, as tough as he was, uh, he could depend on what I told him. If I, I could be trusted. And he placed a lot of confidence in me, and he allowed me to do all this uh, gun work there, which uh, could have put him in an awful bad situation. But uh, uh, he never regretted it. He lived to be proud of the fact. And, of course, his part was played in the movie Carbine Williams by Wendell Corey. Well, now, um, Carbine, when you first came back out of the Navy, you wanted to get married, and uh, your father wanted you to go to work on the farm. You struck out on your own, went to work on the railroad. Money came pretty hard in those days, and you started making a little liquor. Uh, if you had that part to do over again, which, of course, led to your uh, prison term, would, would you go through with that, or what do you think? Well, uh, if I had to go over, a man would... You can never see that far ahead. You never know what tomorrow will bring. And, of course, uh, you would certainly would have... Uh, I would have avo avoid, done all everything I could to have avoided uh, the, all that trouble I got into, that's for sure. Well, uh, there's no question about it. I did have a kind of uh, sorry... Well, I wouldn't say a sorry past, but uh, it was a kind of a past that... Uh, was not looked upon as the nothing any too good. And then I have one son, and I think people more or less uh, looked uh, upon him as his, uh, well, your father made 30 years and all that stuff, you know. And I decided that um, in the place of people looking at him, that I let the whole wide world know who his daddy was, just for his sake, and there there was a move, and nobody, he, I don't think he has to buy and scrape anybody about who his daddy is. They know it now. Well, they know his father is uh, one of the most famous gun inventors in the United States and in the world. Well, I'm glad you said that. Well, it's a fact, of course, and a fine citizen of North Carolina, too. Now, Carbine, in the years since the movie has been made, of course, it came out in the early 50s. Uh, what have you been doing uh, in this past uh, decade? Well, I've been doing the best in develop, uh, 
trying to do something here in the shop, uh, work up something new. And I've been making pretty good progress, I guess, but uh, I wouldn't want to talk about it now. Not at this time. In other words, you've uh, you've got something new under the wraps. Oh, yes. i working on it every day. Well, you and Maggie are still carving out a nice life for yourself out here on the farm near Godwin, aren't you, sir? Well, it, uh, I think it's... Uh, we couldn't be doing anything any better that I know of. Come back here where, we, where all of us were born, right here on the old ground, all of us children, nine is... Eleven of us, eight boys and three girls, we were all born in an old log house about uh, 40 yards right here from this shop. An old log house, great old big log house. What about uh, your son David? What does he do now? Well, he's living in California, as far away as he could possibly go without getting in the Pacific. Um, he's in some kind of building trades out there, construction business or something. And he has three children, that two boys and one girl. That makes me grandpa three times, and you know I'm proud of that. Carbine, tell us about this wooden pistol you made when you were 10 or 11 years old. Well, this is it right there. The stock is made out of juniper wood, and the barrel's made out of a reed. And as you can see, the pivot point there, the nail drove through. It comes through over there and filed off, and... The hammer's wood, and the face, and the striking part of the hammer there, another nail drove in, and the head hits the back of the reed, and on the back of the reed you use an old-fashioned, the tip end of an old-fashioned match head, and that serves as a cap. And of course, as you very well see, it's a muzzle loader. And to keep it uh, from bare from bursting, it's wrapped with strong fishing line. And it makes a pretty strong setup when, once you go around that many times. And, um, well, the first thing you do is to put your powder in there and you take a 22 long rifle cartridge, and an empty one, and you take two of those full of black powder, and that's the charge. Two empty long rifle cartridges, uh, the, the empty shells, you know. And that, that's the charge. And then you take a uh, a little bit of newspaper for wadding and put down over your powder and you, then you put your suitable size buckshot in there and then another little wadding. By that time you've got a lethal weapon there. Oh yes, it'll shoot. <laughs> What's the range on it? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. I, last time I shot it, uh, it was at Fort Bragg and it made quite a pound. All right, we'll try it out here right now. <laughs> All right, I hope it shoots again. Well, that was a pretty good demonstration. Oh, yes, yes. It, it, went all, it went through the first board anyway, and then it's uh, just not an automatic, you know. It's just a single shot, you know. Nobody would be afraid of it. Well, that uh, juniper is pretty hard wood, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's kind of a tough wood. It's not so hard, but it's, uh, had a, it, it's hard to penetrate. Well, it certainly put a hole through there, I'll tell you that. And hit the backboard, too, pretty good did. Uh, yeah, it did. Made a nice dent in that. So, Carbine, that's the famous Carbine that you made at uh, Caledonia Prison Farm back in 1925 or 26. That's right. That's right. And how was it possible for you to make this while in prison? Well, Captain H.T. Peoples, uh, we got along pretty good, and he let me do it. Well, now, there's something very special about this carbine that uh, made it such a great success. Just exactly what was your famous invention? Well, uh, all my automatic guns operate on, uh, is an actuator that operates a very short distance, say around a tenth of an inch or less. And this one here operates <clears throat> with a short stroke, too. There's the part that work, operates this gun. It just moves, I'd say, about 40,000 to 50,000 of an inch.
Now, before you made this, uh, how much did the uh, previous guns move? Oh, they were, they were uh, I'd say they'd move about uh, from three to three and a quarter inches. And so this, uh, help, better. Yeah, this helps make uh, the gun uh, automatic. That's right. Sir. That's what operates the gun right there. And the bolt mechanism locks into this. This is an extension thing. Yeah, the bolt locks into that. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, what you made this uh, carbine out of. What, what, uh, for instance, uh, material did you use there? Well, now uh, this part that the barrel screws in used to be uh, an old Ford uh, crankshaft. That's where I got this this part right there. You know, the throw. Mm -hmm. And this part here, this barrel screwed into. Uh, was the main bearing. So that's a lot of forward in that. Oh, it's all forward. <laughs> <Back. laughs> all right, fine. Now, uh, looking at the other part there, uh, what did you uh, make that out of? Just any old thing you pick up. Well, it's steel. Like, uh, we had plenty of steel that to work with, as far as steel goes. Well, just two steel of various kinds. Now, uh, where did you store this while you were working on it? Well, this particular gun, the reason it's so short is uh, I'd keep it hid in a wall. And the, the shop was made of uh, a wooden building. And I'd have it, the, the shop, I'd have a board fixed so I could take it out and hide it. And Captain Peebles didn't know to start off with, he didn't know exactly what I was doing. But uh, we got along a little better later on. And <laughs> I can imagine the state prison system probably found, uh, frowned on one of the inmates uh, making a rifle. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But Captain Peoples uh, told them, it's a fact that he told them that uh, the people, uh, the head men, that uh, if I give any trouble, He'd be willing to make my time. Uh, this is a carbine that was autographed by General MacArthur during the Law of the Day Parade in New York City. And General Mark Clark also autographed it, and several other people. And I asked General MacArthur for some kind of a statement in regard to this, and he said uh, the carbine was one of the strongest single contributing factors to our victory in the Pacific. And during the last war, there were over 8 million made, and they're being used all over where our allied, the Allied forces operate today, everywhere it seems. This particular magazine in there is a 30-shot magazine. Of course, uh, some of them hold 15. The first one held 15, but the Ordnance Department wanted longer ones, and so the 30-shot magazine was made, and which is a favorite, especially on automatic fire. Well, the carbine weighs around five and a half pounds, something like that, roughly. Well, about 2,000 yards range, and um, it's a, Accurate up to 300 for uh, combat purposes. It's effective for 300 yards. And of course, it's uh, deadly far beyond that. Uh, actually, I guess you could consider it a deadly weapon at a thousand yards, as far as that goes, if you could hit anything with it. Call by on this uh, 22 caliber machine gun's quite a thing. It sure is. It's, it's one of the per reasons for it that was during the war. It saved uh, a lot of lead and, and hard to get material, you know, like brass and copper and everything else was scarce during the war. And, and great saving in ammunition expenses. The government used this uh, 22 caliber for training. Uh, what uh, what machine gun does it most resemble? Well, this particular one don't resemble any gun except itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first one was uh, there. It resembled the Browning. Mm -hmm. Well, I meant. Uh, uh, this gave them training so they could use machine guns, what, like 50 caliber and... Uh, 30 caliber, 30 caliber. Training. Well, any, it, it, train any machine gunner. Okay. Well, how do we fire this thing? Well, it's automatic fire. You just push, push your thumbs on that button and, and let me know when you get ready to shoot it. 
Well, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's fire some short bursts this time. Well, you can run it through if you want to. Well, we'll see what happens. This is, an, uh, this is a cold service ace. As you can see, it is a 20, it's a 22 caliber, the 22 long rifle caliber, but it's on a 45 frame. Well, in order to make a gun work uh, this heavy slide and go the same distance that the 45 goes, you must have uh, some means of increasing the operating energy enough or say equivalent to the recall of a 45. Well, this barrel in here is 22 caliber, and this is the forward. This is a barrel proper, and um, what makes this thing operate is a movable chamber. This little piece here, and it sits right in the rear end of the barrel, and the slide rests against the rear portion of this movable chamber. And moving this short distance, which is around 50 thousandths of an inch or something like that, the slide resting against it, you get that strong push or impact necessary to open the gun the long distance through which it travels. And you get a considerable amount of disturbance when you shoot this gun due to the fact that it sets up a, as much operating energy as a 45 the recall of a 45, and it ain't like shooting an ordinary 22. You get a great bit of, uh, you're more accustomed, we'll say, when you're shooting a 45 after you shoot this than if it didn't have all that energy. And it was adopted by the Army and is used for training, and of course it's the civilian shooters, of course, they went for it too. And it's proved out a very popular gun. Uh, this is what is uh, known and is actually the Winchester automatic shotgun. There's uh, three uh, kinds made. One's the all steel model, and then there's one that has uh, a light alloy aluminum receiver and a steel barrel, and uh, it has aluminum trigger guard too. And that's known as a featherweight. It's the in-between weight. It's a very beautiful gun, and as a matter of fact, they all up here. They have the streamline, of course, as you see, and um, this one I'm holding here is a 59. It's the lightest of them all. It has, this, some people call it a glass barrel. It's not a steel barrel, but it's lined with steel. But it has inside of the, this uh, glass barrel, we'll say, it has a... Um, this piece here, known as my movable chamber, the Williams movable chamber. And the movable chamber, it holds the shell, just the shell. And as you see, it goes just a little longer than the shell. And this bright part you see there on the end is a ground finish after it's heat treated. This is good hard, a good tough steel heat treated, and it's mighty strong. It takes the principal bridge pressure, of course, before it ever reaches the glass barrel. And, and I come along, and not trying to brag about it all, but the world waited about 50 years before this gun, this year particular gun, was designed. This gun here, the Model 50 and the Featherweight 50 and the, and the 59 Winchester. And it, I, can, I could plainly see when I tackled this job, uh, what a job it must have been for somebody to even try. It was the hardest design job that I ever tried in my life. Uh, it looked like nothing wouldn't get right about it. Everything was wrong. The only thing that didn't give any trouble to start with was the movable, my movable chamber. It would always operate perfectly. But to get a suitable feed mechanism and the use of loading and all like that, uh, it's a very easy gun to load, and it doesn't even have a strong magazine spring. It is also very light and easy, easy to load when your fingers are cold and such things and unloads. 
And another thing about it is it handles all shells, the lightest shells and the heaviest shells. Any kind of shell you put in it with no, you don't have to adjust it any way, whatever. And while browning, the browning automatic shotgun is a mighty nice gun, no question about that. But you did have to adjust it for light and heavy loads. And of course, some people, they get one, they were not acquainted or aware of that fact, and they would have trouble. But you have none of that in this gun. And one more, another thing, it, uh, it has about 20% apparently, uh, what I mean, the recoil that you can feel. You have about 20% uh, reduction in the recoil that comes to your shoulder. It's spread over a long period of time. Uh, while well, this uh, mechanism is coming back, it absorbs quite a bit of it. It's a very pleasant gun to shoot. It don't give you that real hard stinging kick like a double barrel or some gun. You can see this glass barrel is somewhat larger than uh, the slender steel barrel. It's a little more graceful, I'd say. Now, <clears throat> there's the steel barrel, and the fit relation is the same on both, all three models. And the mechanisms are all the same, generally speaking. But you see, this fits in the barrel. And you can see the how, about how far. And uh, the shell, as I said, fits into the chamber proper. And the bridge block locks, it's a positive lock. The bridge block locks in this little ang uh, radius cut in there. And this is, the, you see, there's a little plunger there. It's operated by a spring. And when the gun shoots, this abutment here comes to rest in the shoulder, against the shoulder and the receiver after having traveled only about a tenth of an inch, just a little bit, and that's all. But the gun does not begin to unlock immediately after it hits this point right there and stops back here. There's a delay action on it. Uh, <clears throat> to give the shot time to get out of the barrel, there's a slot cut along there, or more or less a straight slot. And then you'll see there's an angle goes this way. Well, that angle part is the unlocking angle. And in other words, uh, this inertia motion set up. There's a rod goes down here, and it gets its motion, and it moves to there before it begins to unlock that distance. And then, of course, it unlocks. Well, by the time it's moved, that delay action, the shot is out of the barrel, I'd say about three feet, roughly. And that's the principle of operation. And uh, a little story about this gun would say, uh, John Brown had made the first successful automatic shotgun ever made. And of course, uh, it's a very great gun design, and there's no question. And he, the patents on that lasted, of course, 17 years, and nobody could make a, a, brown, a successful automatic shotgun, which was a Browning, until uh, 17 years elapsed or uh, went by. And uh, Remington Arms dominated the automatic shotgun field due to the fact that they got on uh, suitable, uh, had a suitable uh, arrangement, business agreement with Browning, and uh, all right, um, after the Brown and patents expired, the several gun concerns, then they went to copying the Browning or the Remington, whichever way you want to call it. It's the same. The Remington was a Browning, of course. And uh, nobody, these several gun concerns wanted uh, a really a different gun, and they wanted just any most, most any kind of an automatic shotgun that they could make.